Hey, what's up guys? It's Will here once again for another Fight Club prediction as we're going to be breaking down UFC Fight Night 136 or UFC Moscow as the UFC finally make their first trip to Russia, which has been long touted, long talked about, and they're finally making their debut here in a card which, for the first time going to Russia, We've got a lot of names on there, um, but could have been better. But it, but it, that's it, it's catered to the local audiences um, for sure. But there's a lot of top fighters I'm looking forward to seeing, and I'm looking forward to the event. So um, before we get started, just thank you for all the new subscribers, the new people that are checking in, the old guys who are still sticking with me. You guys are awesome. Really appreciate um, everything that you do for me and my channel. So thank you very much. Just a couple of little things from last week. I know there was a couple of people, uh, one person in particular, who was a little bit annoyed. I think it was Zachary with me and my um, stop it. It's just it's a natural thing that I've always did since a kid. So I, I apologise. I'm going to try and stop myself from doing it, but it's easier said than done, like I said in the comments there. But I apologise for that. I know I can't be as perfect as I want to be. I'm just not that kind of person. It's just the way I am. It's the way I speak when I'm thinking and speaking at the same time. I just do it. So... Uh, if that annoys you, I apologise. It's maybe better. Maybe you go somewhere else if you like. Um, I won't take it personally, but it's just it's the way I'm. So, uh, as always, thank you for the criticisms. Uh, thank you for just the, the positivity that a lot of you guys show me, which is awesome. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going to get into this one. Uh, just a couple of shout outs again. Um, there was a, a gentleman who messaged me very, very early Sunday morning by the name of Marlo, uh, a guy who watches my predictions. I, I think he has them for the last year or so. And he texted me an absolutely beautiful picture, one of the best pictures you could see at 6.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning. He put on five pounds uh, and walked away with 1,800 pounds. Absolutely nailed it. Uh, I think on a few of his picks he went against me, which is awesome. So he doesn't listen to what I say, he takes a little bit from what I say, but then go with his own thing. That's what I've been saying for years. And went out there and absolutely cashed a beauty. Uh, and I was super happy. That's one of the best things. Yeah, I've had people that have uh, sent me messages, emails, saying that you helped me do this, you helped me win this, your um, advice really helped me in a situation. And to hear something like that and to see stuff like that, you've actually no idea how good that actually feels when uh, you help someone win a big amount of cash or win a DraftKings tournament. Or It's awesome. It's honestly one of the best feelings around. So, Marlo, my brother, congratulations. Hope you're listening to this one. Hopefully you can do it for this card again. I know the odds in a lot of these fights are a little bit iffy, but hopefully you find some winnings out there somewhere. Uh, coming off UFC 228, had a great, had my best event for betting uh, this year. I nailed everything except for the Cody Stamen bet, which was the last bet I made. And I, as soon as I put it on, I was like, uh, I was going between that and Jimmy Rivera, and I went with the underdog. And ultimately, he got beat by Stalin with a, with a beautiful submission. Great, great event. I think the best event of 2018 by far. Really thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, we're going to be moving on here to Russia. As always, from now on, robbrownbetting.com, uh, Rob the guy I am I am with here. I'm trying to... If a lot of people, like I say, ask me for bets uh, and we have to go. This is the guy to go to. He's on a win streak right, right now. That in boxing and in MMA. So if you're if you're with this guy, he is winning you money weekly, and on separate sports as well, which is awesome. Coming into a big run of events here, it's on there to go. And if you're looking for picks to buy, Rob is one of the guys to go and buy from. Um, if you say will, you'll get um, twenty percent off any package that Rob has. Yearly package, I think six month package, a weekly package, and a monthly package. So it makes sense if if you haven't got the time to do all the the analysis that you would like, man, go and do, go and pay someone who is actually doing all that for you and picking out bets that's going to win you money. So, uh, yeah, go and tell Rob he's winning big right now. Um, as I am, I am having a great year for bets, and I'm making up for a really pretty poor 2017, and I've more or less got everything back. So I'm really looking forward to this run into the end of the year. I have uh, two bets, and I've got a third one coming, which I'll, I could tell you at the end of this year if I can remember. But yeah, let's get into the fight card and uh, we'll get straight into it in the bantamweight division with Mirab um, Divalashvili against 
what's his name again, Terry and Ware. I think this is a good fight to start the night, honestly. I think Mirab is a guy who is crazy. He goes very, very hard, rushes at you, garners a lot of takedowns. He's super aggressive, super in your face. But as we've seen in his two fights, uh, he's a guy that fades pretty, pretty badly and gets himself into positions and some of the techniques that he uses that really get him in trouble. Like the Ricky Simone, we had the back of Ricky Simone and then because the way he was on the back, he fell off very, very quickly. So his technique does lack a little bit, but he's super aggressive and he's super, super fun to fight, uh, watch fight. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's hard to trust the guy for the simple fact that uh, he just, I think he was on his way to winning that fight with Ricky Simone until he started um, fading a little bit. And when he started to fade, Ricky started to come into it. He started to get those takedowns. Ultimately, got the submission at the end of the third round where it was kind of, it was a little bit weird because you didn't know whether the guy was in, in consciousness or he was out of consciousness. It looked like he was in for a second and he was out. It was a crazy, crazy, crazy finish to that fight. But his, what he what he brings is a lot of pressure, a lot in your face uh, attacks. It's ready to come at you and is ready to put on a show. Whereas you've got Terry Weir, who's ultimate kind of uh, Johnny Man pro. I would put him not the best fighter. I think he has really good technical boxing. I think he, he counters well when he wants to. Um, but nothing really stands out with the guy. But he is a solid, tough fighter. The UFC have kind of did him. The, the fights have gave him against all like newcomers to the sport, all the, the, the kind of young guys of the sport, and uh, Sean O'Malley, Tom Dukumwa, uh, Cody Stamen. I mean, that's rough fights to have. And look, at, um, I am one of the bigger Tom Dukumwa fans. Uh, and I'm easily going to say that he probably should have got the nod in that fight. But I'm not a... I thought it was close at the time. When I go back and watch it, I think that we are probably did deserve the decision, but uh, I'm not a, a judge. I just judge on what I see, like when, when I give to here. And I thought we had done enough, but the, in the judges' eyes, they, they gave it to Tom Dukumwa. Um, like I say, nothing really stands out for Terry Weir. But the thing, uh, how I think this fight is going to go is I think Mirab's going to come out and he's going to get takedowns. Can he keep him there? I think he can. I think that Terry Weir can also have an opportunity to get back to his feet. And from there, he could start to come into the fight later on. That's kind of where I'm seeing this. <clears throat> First two rounds is very, very um, big in this fight, I think. If Mirab can come out, establish it, I think he wins the first. And then it's interesting to see where the second is. Because I don't think Terry Weir is going to go anywhere. He's going to be there. He's going to be popping out at that jab. And he's going to be looking to... Uh, just stay in the fight and get takedowns. I think in the Tom Dukumar fight, he actually took him down two times. So he might decide to use that in, in the middle part of this round. In the third, this is where I can see maybe Terry and Weir coming in to his own a little bit and potentially getting some back on Marab. The throws a lot of output is obviously it's going to kind of gas a little bit. So, um, But the kind of way I see it is that I think Mirab's going to do more early and I think that's going to count late on in the fight and in the judges' scorecard. So for me, I'm going to pick... Um, Mirab Dilashvili via a, a very close decision. Looking at this card from a DraftKings point of view, I was having a little look earlier on. There's going to be a lot of the, the pricing is going to be weird in this one, so you're going to have to try and pick a couple of dogs out. Now, I might not pick him to win, but I think he might last the, the 15 minutes and he might have a chance to win. So that's kind of where I'm going on that side. But if, uh, as an official fight pick, how I'm breaking this fight down. I see Mirab doing more early and looking better in the judges' eyes. And I, again, I think Terry Weir gets, gets it maybe a little bit dirty and he loses a split decision. But I'm going to go Mirab Divash Philly via a split in that one there. Quality weight division with Ramazan and Meev against Stefan Sukulik. Um, Sukulik is a guy who's coming in here on short notice. And honestly, I didn't know who this guy was. I never heard of him. Uh, went on to Topology to see if he'd been fighting any Russian promotions or something, because I never heard of it. And now I'm not claiming to be the biggest um, component of watching a lot of the Russian organisations. I do watch ECB, I do watch M1 Global, um, Fight Nights Global is another one. 
um, that I watch quite a bit of. You've got some on YouTube as well, YouTube and on UFC Fight Pass. So there is fights there. But this guy fights out the Serbian regional scene, uh, coming with a 12 and 2 record. And the only kind of, I didn't find an awful lot on him, but what I did see is he's extremely aggressive, um, backs up quite a bit against the fence, which I think is going to work into Ramazan Amiv's kind of game plan here where he can take him down and kind of punish him from there. And that's kind of how I see it going. He's coming in here on late, not like a, a late loss, I think less than a week. So that's not the best thing, but you get your opportunity in the UFC. You're not going to say no to turning down the fight in the UFC. Ramazan Amiv is someone, someone we've seen a little bit more of um, with his with um in the ufc we've seen him come in there and we've seen him fight well he's just a really solid mixed martial artist who it's just solid third fight in the ufc come in face sam alvey um outstruck sam alvey got a takedown did enough to win there uh i'll bet i mean i think it's a better win there took him down three times just dominated him on the ground that's kind of how i see this fight going here i think as soon as sukalic makes that back step towards the cage i mean he's going to initiate the the clinch um, maybe use some dirty boxing but eventually he gets the fight to the ground and I think from there his, his top game is going to be far too much for Suklic and I think he could get a finish here, uh, I've been kind of contemplating do I pick him via decision Do I pick him? and the decision is the one kind of likely thing that I think he could get here but I think he's got good enough ground and pound to get this guy out there as well and I think he's got submissions there so I'm going to pick Ramazan Amiv um, I'm going to pick him to win via I'm going to go ground and pound round number two. And actually, before I move on, last week I had a guy saying, sorry, I forget your name. He says, that, could I take away like the methods of the fights? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make two lists, one with the times and methods and one with just the times of the fight. So you can go and look and see if you want to look at how I'm thinking the fight's going. So you'll see them down in the drop-down box. I just thought I'd get that out before I do forget. But I mean, via the... Uh, Kiki over there in the second round. Moving on into, sorry, my computer is playing up a little bit. There we go. Uh, middleweight division, we have Jordan Johnson against the newcomer, Adam uh, Yandiev, and another guy. I had no, no idea about in Yandiev. And I was thinking, why have I not heard from this guy? If, I think he's got an undefeated 9-0 record. Why have I not heard about him on these kind of Russian promotions? And that's because he hasn't fought in three and a half, I think nearly four years. Three to four years in that region, somewhere around there. Um, so that is why I've not heard of this guy. Uh, and what I've seen of him, nothing great, honestly. Um, I think he's a bit of a fan pleaser because out there he swings, there's not much technique, his, his chin is in there, he just kind of plants those feet and throws bombs uh, in kind of any opportunity he can. But ultimately he's leaning to get the fight to the ground, I think. Like I said, zero technique, but as aggressive as the as they come pretty much, he's there, uh, just ready to throw down and kind of hurt you. Um, he's showing me that he has got power in his hands, but really when it comes to anything other than his striking arsenal, he's very, very limited in my opinion. On the mat, which I think is his stronger point, I think he is very kind of one-dimensional uh, with his grappling. I think his transitions aren't good. His, like, him passing to new positions aren't good. He really just wants to to move to a position where he can grab a hold of the neck. He seems to be one of these guys who's got a strong grip um, and a strong choke. And if he gets you in those um, parts of the fight where he can get a hold of your neck, like bulldog chokes from the bottom, rear naked chokes, he's very, very good at getting out there because he has got strong, strong grip. Um, and, it, and he is quite imposing on the ground as well. And majority of, of his nine wins have come via submissions. He's, he's got a various amount of chokes out there as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I see it going with Yandev. He's going to want to try and get this to the ground if he can, because I think he is super aggressive down there. Um, the, the one thing I didn't like is when he goes for the neck, there is better positions where he can move to, maybe the mount position, and he doesn't really take advantage of that. And that's something that it could help him more, but it's obviously just the way the the guy fights, and that's that's the way he is with him there. But a three year layoffs, a little bit of a a red flag, I want to say, but I think in this matchup it might not kind of matter so much here uh, as he's facing Jordan Johnson, who surprisingly won his two fights in the UFC and is making his way down to 185. Um, 
watched an interview today saying that he has uh, left the Lions MMA, he's went back to Arizona where his family is, fair enough. So, and I, I went on his Instagram and seen he's been training with uh, Stevie Dalloway, who fights in this card, and Ryan Bader is a fight coming up in Bellator. So those kind of local Arizona guys who had their own camp many, many months ago uh, are there. But uh, 3-0, I should say, in the UFC. No 2-0. I thought it was 2-0. Henrik De Silva, very, very convincing, but a very impressive debut in the UFC. Henrik De Silva's not that good. Marcel Fortuna, not great. Went to a split with Adam Milstead. So, uh, yeah, the, the one good thing about Jordan Johnson is he has good wrestling, and that's where he looks to kind of take the fight. Both these guys have terrible gas tanks. They don't have ga- uh, very good gas tanks, and that's how I kind of see this fight kind of going. It's very, very sloppy. Um, this is the fight I've been going back and forward on. Uh, initially, I was on Jordan Johnson, watched the uh, Yandiev, and I thought, right, I think he's got an opportunity here just by the aggressiveness that he has. And um, if he gets in that top position and starts raining punches, he could potentially find something to put Jordan Johnson out there. But honestly, guys, uh, I'm struggling with my pick here. Um, I want to pick the underdog. I want to pick Yandev, but I just feel the more technique and the more better all-around grappler is Jordan Johnson. If he's into that wrestling grind, then I think he could win the fight. But I am not ruling Yandev out. This is going to be a fight. I'm going to pick Jordan Johnson be a decision. But ultimately, I'm going to, it's going to go on my least confident pick because I don't think he's... Um, a clear favourite to say the least. Now, I don't know what the odds in this one are, but uh, I would see some people taking probably a shot in Yandev. I don't think it's the worst shot in the world, honestly. Uh, I think Yandev was like plus 200. That was one I do remember sticking out. The simple fact that I bet Diego Sanchez, so it's still kind of in that region. When Once I see those numbers, some of them stick in my head, some of them don't. But I think Yandev's life, I just think that um, Jordan, Jordan Johnson, if he, if he cuts well, um, has a good weight cut, uh, and fights the way he should, Maybe as Yandev's coming in, he could time those takedowns and, and land in the, the better positions on the ground. He could win the fight there. So that's kind of where I'm going. I'm going to pick him to win via decision, but ultimately not super confident I'm getting the win there. Light heavyweight division, we've got Magomed and Klaev against Martin Pracnio. Uh, we'll start off with Pracnio just because I'm about to kind of lose it with uh, Ankalaev or not top shit to say the least, but just run him down a little bit. But uh, Marcin Pratnio came into the UFC, n- didn't really know an awful lot about him, and he didn't really show much in his UFC debut against uh, Sam Alvey, where he got knocked out in the first round. Um, really super bad defence, but he is a super aggressive guy in the feet, so that's something you have to be be careful with here. But um, again, I kind of thought he was a little bit live, and then I'm like, I don't think he can stop a takedown all too well. I think that he's very kind of green on the ground. Um, so I'm like a little bit iffy there, but like I say, when you when you take away from his UFC debut, chin in the air, get hit with a shot, and then ran towards Sam Aldi with his chin. He never even had his hands up after eating a big shot, and then just got slept badly. Um, and that's a little bit of a worrying sign for me. Now, moving on to Magomed Ankalaev. Jeez, oh. I'm sure not, I'm not the only one that kind of thinks this here regarding him and his UFC debut against Paul Craig. I bet, I thought I had a good line. I can't remember what the line was. Uh, was it minus 187? I thought, yeah, it was. Minus 187 on Ankalaev. And I thought, there we go. That is going to be easy money. And for 14 minutes, 59 seconds, it was looking like easy kind of money. And then he gets tapped out with one, one second to go. And I was like, you have got to be shitting me. Absolutely shitting me. The one thing that I hate is the fact that it was one second away. Surely, as a fighter, he must have been aware with that, the clapper's going with 10 seconds to go, that he could survive that. And he tapped out. Now, I'm not saying that Paul Craig's squeeze isn't legit. But you should not be getting caught and you should not be tapping out with one second to go in a fight you've clearly dominated. And not unless it's a, the, the submission is in, and I think it was in, but I think he, he could have done enough to survive an extra second. I, I, well, I still had a losing night, by the way, in London, um, because I, I pretty much shit the bed with every kind of bet I had that night, except for Dukemar, which I, like I stayed earlier on, got a little bit lucky with. 
But yeah, in that fight as well, Paul Craig took him down twice. He transitioned very, very well. He pounded Craig, uh, Paul Craig, uh, throughout the whole fight from side control, from a, a top position, and just beat him up for 15 minutes, except for one whole second of that 15 minutes, and got caught. Big red flag for me um, betting this guy moving forward. I won't be touching him just for the fact that he's quit. He's shown he can quit in, in situations where he could have survived, I think, and went out there and uh, lost the fight. In this one here, I think it, it's, it's the clear, better striker. Just have to be careful with the power that Plaxneil shows because he does show a little bit of, of good power. I think takedowns are there if he wants to use it. I think he's got a lot better ground and pound. I think he, he's got a lot better control. I know he's got a lot better control than Martin, than Martin Plaxneil because he, we've seen regional videos of him guys who have not even got wrestling backgrounds, take him down and control him down there as well. Uh, for me, I'm going to pick Magomed and Kalaev, and I'm going to pick him via decision, but no bet, not going anywhere in there. I don't even know what the line is. I'm not even looking because after what happened last time, but I'm picking Ankalaev to win the decision now. Uh, moving on, lightweight division. Mere back Tyson of his back, guys, and he's against Desmond Green here. Uh, I don't know what the hell is going on with Mere back Tyson of. I am so sad that we only get to see this guy once a year. I think it's really, really bad. I don't know why UFC aren't uh, matchmaking him. I know he, he can't really fight in Canada or America due to visa problems, but it still doesn't mean he can't fight in Europe. He's fought in Germany before. They, they, they fought in Germany this year. They fought in London. Um, there was another one that's coming off the top of my head where I, I know he could have fought in. I can't remember where it was. At Liverpool. He could have fought in Liverpool. That's the one there that they could have matched him up on. And the guy hasn't fought in a year, and he literally only fought once last year. When you look at me, I bet Tysonov, he is so good on the eye. Great, great wrestling. People forget that he comes from a wrestling background, especially the last four or five fights where he's absolutely hurt guys badly in fights. Um, like I said, beat Tang Yun Bang on his debut years ago. Michelle Pizarres, he, he went into that fight ill. He had the flu. That's why he lost that one. Not taken away from Pizarro, because Pizarro is a tough, tough dude. Um, but I think if he was at 100%, he beats Michel Pizarro. He got taken down in that fight far too easily and got controlled down there. Then he beat Marcin Bandel, destroyed him. Cristodolo destroyed him. One fight that I watched a couple of times is Alain Patrick. Alain Patrick, we all know what he is. He's a, he's a blanket kind of guy. He wants to take you down and just lie on you. Never even got close to doing that against Mirabek Tysonov and um, Alan Patrick was trying everything in the book there. He kicked him in the balls, thumb to the eye, and ultimately once he realised he wasn't going to get this guy down, he started expending energy by throwing silly strikes, rolling about the ground. Ultimately, he got back up, hit him with a head kick, followed up with heavy ground and pound to beat Alan Patrick. Then he faced Demir Hadzovic, and I'm a fan of Demir Hadzovic, like I've said before. And uh, Hadzovic had a good couple of minutes in that fight. He was landing some good shots. And he was fighting, Mirabek was fighting the type of fight that Demir Hadzovic liked. It kind of wide open, slinging strikes. Hadzovic got big power he could hit you with. But eventually, about 30 seconds before the fight got ended, Tysonov started landing really clean, clean strikes to the temple, the, the chin. And you could see it was starting to have a little bit of effect on Hadzovic. Then as they backed, up, backed, him, up, backed him up to the cage, unleashed an absolutely worldy, uh, uppercut that put Hadzovic down and the referee I think did the right thing in jumping in and Hadzovic was pissed obviously still felt he had his bearings about him but it was a good stoppage and then the Felipe Silva one Felipe Silva just got too aggressive came forward and absolutely caught a massive massive counter right hook right in the chin that absolutely pulled um, floored sorry um, Felipe Silva and it was a vicious vicious knockout um, but when you look at the opponents he's faced they don't really show Show much. Pizarro is probably his toughest opponent. And he lost him in saying that. But this guy's had so many fights scheduled with Evan Dunham. Uh, there's other guys I forgot off the top of my head who was supposed to be fighting who are tough. And they've just kind of fell, fell to the wayside a little bit. And that sucks because this guy, we're missing out, we're only seeing him once a year. It really is kind of soul destroying when you, you hear that he's got a fight, and then he gets taken off due to something, and then you don't see him again. I hear from him in six months here. Now, I am a little bit worried about this fight for the simple reason that Des Green, if you do not know, about two, I'm going to say two, maybe three weeks ago, 
was he was involved and he was the guy that started a car accident or he was one that initiated a car accident um, that involved killing two people and a third person in really bad ways in the hospital and kind of life-threatening injuries. And then I actually read last night that two weeks before that he was cited for driving without insurance and um, without he, was just, he never had insurance, he wasn't allowed to drive. Yet two weeks later he did that and two, ended up two people dying. There was a picture of him on the freeway there looking shell-shocked. It was very early in the morning as well, I remember. So it's a really interesting thing here. I'm surprised he's still fighting. Honestly, I'm surprised the UFC haven't pulled him out. I'm surprised he hasn't pulled out. Um, the guy's head cannot be in the fight. There's no way, if you're a normal human being and you have did something that has taken people's lives initially. You might not be to blame for it, but you're still taking two, like two people have died. That's a lot to, to have in your mind. And then you're coming in here against the guy like Mayor Tyson Wolf, who's hungry, wants to fight, wants to get his name back out there for people to start talking about him again. That's a tough thing. What I will say about Desmond McDaniels is no easy out, um, but there is no way, looking at him here, I don't see a path to victory one little bit. A, he can't work with him. B, he's not going to grapple with him because Beckham has, I think, the better, the better, um, he has the better grapple and the better wrestling. We just don't see it. He is coming off a win over Gleason t t is now out of the UFC, which he's been there for years. Lost to Pizarres, lost to Kabalov, who I think, I still think that Tyson Mob is better than those fighters. And yeah, I think you see where I'm going with this one here. I think the day screen is ripe for Tyson Ove to absolutely buzz the room. Don't like the fact that Des Green's actually fighting this this fight here. It just doesn't sit right with me. But like I say, this is his job. This is how he makes his money. This is how he feeds his family. So I can see why he's taking the fight. It's just, it's a tough situation for the guy. I wish him all the best for Garden coming through that situation because it's tough, must be tough. Um, one thing that I like about Green the fact that he's fought in Russia so it's not going to be I'm sure the fighters have not fought there it's going to be hard to kind of climatise and fight in a different country and a different culture he's been there, he's seen it knows what goes on for me I just struggle to see how he wins this fight and my good buddy Justin from Bropex has went and bet Des Green I have no idea how he sees him winning this fight somehow he does and he's laid some units down on him to win the fight here. Yeah, it doesn't, I don't know. I don't know what Justin's on with that one. But, hey, I'm going to, there's an opportunity that I'm going to be betting me about Tyson Mov in a parlay um, with someone later on in the card. So, hopefully I win and kind of dead screen loses so I can win that. But, uh, yeah, me up bet Tyson Mov. For me, I think he's going to run through this guy. I think if he was to back him against the fence, he would unload strikes and hit him. I think if, Green gets a little bit too aggressive. He's going to catch him with a counter strike, a big right hand, a big um, body kick, or something that put him down. So for me, me a bit Tyson of Bacon to win uh, via round one stoppage via TKO. There. Moving on, we have uh, in the lightweight division we have Hustam Habalov against Cajun Johnson, and Cajun Johnson is kind of getting done a little bit dirty here. He only fought literally about eight weeks ago, maybe not even that. He pretty much got dismantled by Islam Makachev very early on here. We all know the rumblings between the UFC and Cajun Johnson. The UFC don't really want him around. So they're getting him back in there against another guy who's very hard to fight in Kabi Love. Uh, yeah, I'd, I struggle to see where Cajun Johnson can win here. But what I will say is that this is fighting. He's got nothing to lose. People are just a grinding, grinding fighter. Um, and it's got some fairly decent names on his record there. Cajun Johnson has got nothing. And when you see like Cajun Johnson, he was on like a four or, four or five fight win streak. Um, and they had a couple of you like that impressive finish over Adriano Martins. That fight was really bad. But he still came out there and knocked him out. Beat uh, Kotani, and he's not great. Stevie Ray, I thought that was a very close fight. But then he got 
submitted by Islam Makachev in that fight last time out. I just don't see where he wins the fight. I see Rustam pressing him against the cage, getting them there and getting takedowns and hurting the ground and pound. I can maybe see Cajun getting back to his feet, but then I see him getting taken down again. But like I say, out of all the big favourites in this card, Kabilov is the guy that scares me the most if I was betting him. I'm not betting him. I don't know what his odds are. I know they're four, five, six hundred, and probably higher than that. Maybe actually five, six, seven hundred in that region. Scary, scary bet in my opinion, just for the fact that Cajun is solid and he is got nothing to lose here. So he can come out here and just balls to the wall and hopefully maybe take him out, maybe knock him out. But I, I struggle to see that. I'm going to go Kabalov via a, a decision now. Moving on, Bantamweight division. Looking forward to seeing this guy, Peter Yan against Yin So Sun. This guy, is kind of, he's kind of like Zabit. Nobody really wants to fight this guy. He has fighters falling out left, right and centre. He was supposed to fight Douglas de Silva de Anvage, which I thought was going to be a great fight. I thought it was a really good big fight for Peter Yan because Andrade is good and he's very, very tough. He pulled out. Someone else came in. I got a message saying 24 hours later, this guy doesn't want to fight. Pulled out. He got another opponent, I believe. He pulled out within 24 hours. They've had to bring in this Yin Su son, who uh, I only seen one fight of, and he's fighting these local guys in the Japanese uh, circuit on deep. Um, fairly decent record of it, but nothing really great. Um, pretty, pretty much so so striking, kind of did okay with combinations to get in takedowns and on the, the, the fight that I saw. Um, but I really didn't take an awful lot away from there uh, from that fight. I, I probably need to see more, but it was ha- quite hard actually to find fights on this guy so yeah and then he's facing Peter Yan here and like we saw in the first fight in the UFC is he absolutely buzzsawed through um, Teru Ishihara and is one of the guys I hear Mark is having a massive 2019 and making his way up that into that top five of that bantamweight division um, a lot of his fights are on YouTube the Mateos Matos TKO Brutal Great fights with Magomed, Magomedov. Really, really good fights. The, the, the win over Ed Arthur. So, yeah, this guy's just a bit of a buzz on. He's coming in, he's a 9 and 1 record. Uh, he wants to fight. He wants to get himself his name out there. He wants to be fighting. I know he wants to be fighting better opposition than what he's facing in these two UFC fights. Um, I don't see how Sun really sticks around or does anything in this fight. It's MMA. Anything can happen. But for me, Peter Yan is just too. Too nasty of a fighter uh, for for Sun, and it's going to run through him in the first round via TKO. And the prelims I've done there, and it's very, very kind of lopsided. In fact, it's not done there, but one more, which is not, I'm guessing it's going to be on the prelims. And it's going to be CB Dolloway against Khalid Marta Zalaev. Um, CB Dolloway was supposed to be facing, uh, oh, actually, I forgot he was supposed to be facing initially. And let me see, let me, let me, let me see, because I know he's supposed to fight full of Omari Atmadov, that was it. He was supposed to be fighting Omari Atmadov, which I thought was going to be a really good close fight. I was leaning Atmadov in that one there. Then he pulled out, and Artem Frolov got signed to the UFC, the M1 Global Middleweight Champion, which I thought was a great, great, great signing. I was picking Frolov there. I was thinking of betting Frolov. Then two or three days later, he pulls out, he got injured, and now he's been um, replaced by uh, Matas Dalaev. Who I, I watched tape on uh, a little bit yesterday, and I watched the majority of it today. And I think he's a really solid pro. I think he's he's got a decent record. The fights that he saw, he's got decent grappling. Uh, there was a couple of fights there where he was the guy was approaching him instead of counter striking, he was kind of running off, which I really didn't like too much. But in that fight also, I think that he folded somewhere with a, a beautiful body kick. He also mixes up his striking well into his grappling. And once he gets his grapple in there, he's got some pretty heavy ground and pound. It's just a case of whether he can take CB Dalloway down frequently, consistently, and post up and uh, and put CB Dalloway under some pressure. There. I think he has to get his respect on the, the feet, first of all. CB, I think, is there with hips, body, and head. He's coming off a two fight win streak. Um, I know the, the last fight, he pretty much got put out by Hector Lombard. Then he Hector followed up with some strikes very late on 
and that ultimately won the fight via kind of like a DQ, I think it was, or um, something like that. I remember, I remember that one there. He won that one, DQ, illegal punches, beat Ed Herman. But I do think he's at the the tail end of his career here, and he's facing a young, hungry Russian here who's going to want to come in and, and put on a show. Uh, I can't pick CB Dolloway. I think I don't know what the odds on this, but I don't know if it's even been released yet. Um, but if Khalid had had a better, or had a longer run for this fight, a run up to this fight, I think I would have picked him. Been pretty confident on him. I still think it's a hard debut against a guy in the CB Dolloway who's been around for the longest time, won a lot of fights in the UFC, uh, and is a tough opponent. But I like the newcomer a little bit more. I just think that he's going to be, he's going to want, I actually just think he's going to want this win a little bit more here, honestly. And um, yeah, I think he could stop CB Dolloway. So I'm going to pick Khalid uh, Mata Zalaev again uh, via TKO early, round number three. But you've got to remember, he is coming here on short notice. So he might not be in the best of conditions. So it might be a prime opportunity for CB Dolloway to get the win here. I just struggle. I find it hard to say, yeah, yeah I'm picking CB Dolloway and I'm confident in it. I'm not. I'd rather take the newcomer who I think is more hungry and wanting the win more here. So, uh, Matas Laev via TKO round number three. So, that's us on to the main card there. Uh, we're going to be starting off in the welterweight division with a guy that, when I heard he was signed to the UFC, I was like, yes, 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 yes. Um, Alexei Konchenko against Thiago Alves. The UFC know what they're doing here. 100% know, know what they're doing here. They're giving a guy who is 18 and 0. Uh, I've watched a lot of his fights. I watched some more of them today. I watched some of his early fights, some of his kind of like um, four or five and 0 fights. His 10, 12, 10, 11, 12, and then into his last few fights, where he is just a consummate professional and so dangerous in so many areas. The one thing that it's a little bit worrying for me, the fact he's 33 years old or 34 years old, so he is old, coming into a, a killer of a division. But I honestly think he will be in the top 10 of this division very, very quickly. And those guys, when I look at that record in the, the top 15 at Welterweight and the top 10, I see him beating handily. I really, really do. So what does Konchenko bring bring to the game there? Um, like I say, been, I think he's been high level for a long time. He's got the opportunity to come in here. The guy has got spectacular defense um, and has never really been in any trouble whatsoever um, on his back, on your feet. Sometimes especially if the guys are good when you he was in the Russian military, he was a hand-to-hand combat champion there, and he comes from a Muay Thai background. So that mix is an elite mix to come into a division like Welterweight. Great technical boxing, um, really good exploding shots, very, very big combination striker um, when he gets the opportunity to throw. And uh, he'll throw him there two, two, three combination and look to, to kind of get in there and grapple with you a little bit. Uh, when he lands flush, he has some big power. And, he, and on top of that, he is super, super accurate. So that's something that you have to really um, respect, pretty much. Good wrestler. He's got a great double leg, uh, great grip. If um, you watch his fight, I think it's four. No, I can't remember his opponent. He's, he was from Spain, Fuese, I think his name was. Um, what he did then was he grappled, and he he was making adjustments while he was doing it. As his fight careers went on, he did more and more of that, and he looks better every time with the adjustments, small little adjustments I'm noticing, it's only little things, um, but then he gets big slam takedowns. When he gets to top position, he lands uh, big strikes. He's very good with his um, framing you off and landing strikes from the, like a top position and so on. Um, but yeah, he's got really good dirty boxing against the fence. Um, he's gone the distance. Like out of 18 times, only four times. So the guy has, and he's been five rounds as well, which I love. Like I say, I just think this is a great matchup for him. He's facing a guy in Tuago Alves who is not the Tuago Alves we once knew, but he has got a bit of name recognition. He's fought the best in the division, to say the least, with you know, your Matt Hughes, 
the Jean Saint Pierre. But the guy's been a shell the last few day, few years, and he's he's not got the footwork he once has. I don't think he's got the pop he once has. The UFC, are, are, this is the prime matchup I think for Kinchenko to get his name out there, destroy Thiago Alves, and move himself further up the ranks. And I think that's what they're doing because by giving him someone like Thiago Alves in your debut, you can instantly maybe win the next two fights, put him in that top 15, in my opinion. That's seen a lot in that type of division. When I look at the top 15, Alex Oliveira, Curtis Millinder, I see him beating those kinds of type of guys. Don and Kim, easily. Cerrone, easily. Uh, Gunnar, I think he gives a lot of trouble to Gunnar. Uh, maybe like a Leon Edwards, uh, Vicente Luque, uh, Al Hassan, I think he could give, make, make it look fit easy against. But like Thiago Alves, he's got no footwork. He's very, he's not the fighter he once was. Taken a lot of damage. He's taken a lot of damage recently. This is Konchenko's fight here. I think he stops him. I think the first round he comes out, grapples, beats him up. Second round, he beats him up again. Uh, and within the second or third round, I think he stops him here. So I'm going to go a second round. TQ victory there for Alexei Konchenko. Moving on, heavyweight division. We have... Uh, sorry, what happened there? There we go. Um, Andrea Lovskins, Shamil Abdurakhimov. Interesting fight here, and I've seen a little bit of talk about the UFC Moscow card, and people kind of shitting on Andre Alovsky a little bit. But honestly, I think this is a winnable fight for him. Shamil, a guy I've never really been overly impressed with. He's had his spots where he's fought well, especially last time out when he stopped Chase Sherman. Chase Sherman takes a lot of shots, and if you can land a clean one, you can put him down. Um, the Derek Lewis fight, he definitely won the first three rounds, but when Derek Lewis got the opportunity to get that full amount, he took it, finished them very, very convincingly. Doesn't have a hell of a lot of output. I think he's going to want to look to clinch here and try and take this to the mat. And Arlovsky, to his credit, has never been the easiest guy to take down. So, um, I think that Shamil's going to, not if he doesn't land that big shot in the chin of Andre Arlovsky, I think that he is going to struggle a little bit in this fight here. And I still think that Andrea obviously has got a little song, something in him. In the Taitui Vasa fight, um, I don't think he, he was overly great in that one. Um, but since he's went to the American top team, I think that they've formulated game plans a lot better. They've fought to his strengths um, with the striking and so on. Beat Junior Albini. To me, Junior Albini looked a little bit kind of starstruck to be in there with someone like uh, Andrea Lovsky and ultimately kind of ended up losing the fight through that. And then, who was his previous opponent? I forget. Stefan Struve. Um, he came in there, and Stefan Struve's a shell of himself. He's a young guy, um, but he's been in a lot of wars, at, and ultimately that's kind of taken its toll. Before that, he lost five in a row. Stipe, Overeem, Ingano, Tybura, all tough fighters to face. Um, ultimately, went out there and lost those fights. But I think there's a fight that if he can keep standing, I think he can. He has enough striking knowledge um, and enough experience. He's got experience for days that he can cope with someone like Shamil. Shamil, in my opinion, is going to want to grapple, put him against the cage, look to take him down. I don't think Arlovski is as easy to take down. Um, I don't think he's ever really been easy to take down. And I think this, if he keeps it standing, he wins the fight here. So for me, I'm, I feel more confident picking Andre Arlovski uh, in this one. I've seen people really confident in Shamil and, and laying down some money on him. I'm like, eh. No, for me, maybe they see something I don't. And that's what I like to hear from people in the drop-down boxes. They might see something different to me. and Because, uh, like I say, nobody's perfect at picking fights. Very, very... Um, there's very few guys out there that pick fights consistently. A lot right all the time. It's just about how you see it. For me, I'm going to pick Andrea Lovsky to win via decision there. So, yeah. Moving on to the cool main event. This is a really, really good fun, interesting fight, and I think the best fight in the card, and I have a bet on this one here, so it's Jan Blachowicz against the returning Nikita Krylov, who was in the UFC, left the UFC, went back to Russia, won some, uh, got some big money fights over there in uh, Fight Night Global, faced a couple of kind of names, and Fabio Maldonado and Emmanuel Newton, if you know who these guys are, Fabio was in the UFC, Emmanuel Newton was in the Bellator, was the Bellator champion. And in those fights, he looked great. He looked he looked like he's... People are going to say he was fighting and he wasn't fighting the best of fighters. And that's that's how you think. I think Newton 
he's at the tail end of his career. He's still a really durable fighter. You've got to be careful with him. And <laughs> he loved went out there. Absolutely smashed him. Beautiful knee straight up the middle inside the first 45 seconds, knocked him out. Then in the the Maldonado fight, Maldonado was never easy to fight because the guy takes a lot of punishment. And once you start to tire and you show those chinks that you're going to be out there um, and you, you're, you're slowing down, that's when he comes on and pressures you. Um, that fight started with Krilov Nierman with a kick to the sack that Maldonado didn't, didn't really look like he was really wanting to kind of go on after that. Um, then in the second round, they were initiating, initiating a clinch. Krilov was trying to get a takedown. And as they were coming up, he absolutely nailed him with a massive right hand against the fence there that uh, knocked out Maldonado. And Maldonado's a really tough guy to knock out cold. And he did that very, very um, impressively, to say the least. When you go back and look at Krilov's uh, UFC career beforehand, he he lost a couple of fights there, which I I think I picked him against Misha Sakhanov. Kind of shit the bed a little bit there. Um, we've seen where he's got a little bit of a not he's not as great as something he has to work on. Obviously, and um, got caught in that guillotine choke. We've seen him against OSP where he got caught in that Von Flew choke. But when when he when he's had to beat the guys, he beats like your know, Donovan, your Nedkovs, uh, Bahoso, Herman. Not great fighters, but he's went out there, handled them, and he stopped them. The guy's one of those fighters that will stop you or or will pretty much be stopped. And that's, that's the kind of fighters I like. And to put it on top of that, the guy's only 25 or 26 years old. He is going to be coming into his prime very, very soon. But he has got a tough fight here in Jan Blachowicz here who has looked fantastic in his last couple of fights. Um, since he went back to his old coach, funnily enough, which... Uh, which he seemed to turn him around a little bit. He looked a little bit stale through some of his early parts of his UFC career. Come in there with it, obviously the win over Latifi, which I still think is his best win. When you look at it now, honestly, I think that that is his best win. Um, but then he won that fight, lost to Manoa, lost to Corey Anderson, lost to Gustafsson, lost to Patrick Cummins. Like Patrick Cummins, I don't think so. I really... That's a bad loss, honestly. I don't think he's that great a fighter. The Gustafsson fight, I think Gus was coming back after a layoff. Uh, and he did very well in the feet, and then ultimately Gustafson started taking him down and, and controlled the fight and won that big decision. But he is on a three-fight win streak. Devin Clark um, got too aggressive, came forward, got caught with the kind of the, the standing bulldog submission, and uh, got a tap out there. Beat Jared Cannonier pretty convincingly. Then he had an absolute war with Jimmy Manoa, and I cashed him as an underdog in that fight there. I just thought he was going to really do the business in that when he looked focused. And he's a guy that does not get finished either so he's really really tough to put away um, the only guy that I think has only stopped him is uh, there was an early one that I can't remember but there was Sokoju I think he stopped him via leg strikes in that one there as well he retired he didn't come off the stool that was way back KSW about 2012 I want to say um, and the fight I wouldn't watch that one back so you can break the guy down with, with technical striking not to say that Krylov is your big technical striker, but he's dangerous in every facet and super aggressive. So, if I'm, I'm going to pick Nikita Krylov, by the way. So, if I'm going to pick him, I think I'm going to pick him to win via a stoppage, and that's something that doesn't really happen with Blahovic too much. I think that he is the better striker, all around striker. I think he's got the more dangerous submissions, but Blahovic is at, I think he's what 35, so he's kind of old for that division, but it is an old man's kind of division, is the, the light heavyweight division, apart from a couple of guys who are probably early 30s, like Gustafsson and uh, maybe Uzdemir and so on. So a lot of the guys are in that 35 to 40 kind of range. So maybe he is coming into the best part of his career. I would rather take the fighter who I think is coming into his prime. It's the more dangerous fighter in a lot of the facets there. I'm a little bit worried that Blavich might use a kind of grappling game here and maybe take him down and potentially get a finish. But for me, like I say, I, I wanted to pick the guy who's coming into his prime, who's more dangerous, who can knock you out with one punch like we've seen um, on odd occasion, and he has submissions as well. So I'm picking a creative clear of to win via TKO round number two. I bet him at minus... I got him at minus 101. So nearly dog money, which I was a little bit shocked I'd get that close um, to that. So I'm going to be picking... 
um, Nikita Krylov via TKO in that one there. And the main event of the night, we have the Super Samoan Mark Hunt against the Boa Constrictor Alexei Olenek. And uh, ultimately, I'm going to pick Mark Hunt here. I'm coming out and picking Mark Hunt. I'm seeing a lot of people quite confident in Olenek here, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder kind of what they're seeing. I'm not. Now, everybody seems to talk about, oh, but Mark Hunt, uh, he got submitted by Sean McCorkle, 2010, I want to say that was, eight years ago. That was when he didn't give two shits about getting back up submissions. He didn't you go back and watch his early MMA fights when he was still a kickboxer. Everybody submitted him because they didn't want to stand with the dude. Since then, he's got a lot better. He still gets taken down fairly easily, but he has a get-up game and he won't quit ever down there. Stephen Miosic took him down on numerous occasions, kept getting back up. His last fight, Curtis Blades, started taking the guy down. Um, he didn't, but like I say, Mark Hunt started to hurt him on the feet. So that's why that Curtis Blades was reacting by going for takedowns, which was the smart thing, was completely the game plan that he had to use against Mark Hunt in that fight, because Mark Hunt, if he catches you clean, and he did catch Blades clean, but Blades into an oh, right, so took him down and, and got his wits back about him. If he took another couple of shots, he was out there. Um, when when I look at this matchup here, I mean, you look at Mark Hunt's record, it's like 13, 12 and 1, but he's faced the who's who of the division. He's knocked out some great, great guys, Frank Mia, Derek Lewis, Antonio Silva, um, Roy Nelson, Stephen Struve. He's knocked them out, all out kind of viciously. Czech Congo way back in the day. Now we're going back a long way, like six years ago. And he, he only really loses to the elite guys, your Junior Santos, your Fred Boots of Doom, your Stipe, Overeem, Curtis Blades. He's faced a better caliber opposition. Alex Olenek has not faced the comp- competition that he has. And when you put the two skill sets together, you've got the grappler, jiu-jitsu guy in Olenek, who is just weird with some of the stuff that he pulls off. But there's a clear disparity on the feet. And this is where the fight starts here. On it comes out and he kind of jabs away and he, his chin's in the air and he takes shots really easily. Um, but he's going to want to come out. I think if he wants to get the fight to the ground, he's going to have to get in close to Mark Hunt. And ultimately, I think he leaves his chin in the air, he leaves his body there to be hit. But you cannot let someone like All get his hands on you and especially drag you to the ground. I don't even think he has to drag you to the ground. He could do a lot of standing submissions, in my opinion, as well. I think that. Not unless he comes out, kind of takes a few shots and maybe flops to his back and hopes that Mark Hunt kind of comes into his guard, which I don't think Mark Hunt's that stupid enough to do. Then ultimately, I just think it plays into Mark Hunt. Uh, Mark Hunt's kind of game plan here. I think he, he, if he was to flop to his back, he would get straight back to his feet. He would say, get back up. And I think he would find the chin. He gets busted up. He's got really bad defence. So for me, when I see people like Bet and Olenek, I'm like super surprised at that. But because the, the frailties are there to be seen. And I think everybody goes on like, oh, it just takes him to, to clinch up one time. He can catch him in a submission. He can take him to the ground. And I don't see it as being as easy as that against Mark Hunt, um, honestly. But the guy has some serious submissions. Uh, the Ezekiel chokes that he finds from positions he shouldn't even be catching guys is crazy. If he gets an opportunity to get him down there, then he might just catch him. I struggle to see him get Mark Hunt down, honestly. Um not unless he hurts on the feet, which which is I don't think that will happen. For me, I think he's going to knock out Alexei Olnick within the first two rounds. If I'm picking a round, I'm going to pick the first round. Five minutes is a long time against the guy against Mark Hunt. Not unless Mark Hunt just comes out, kind of assesses the situation, and then decides to kind of pull the trigger when he wants to. Um, but for me, I'm picking Mark Hunt. I'm not picking Olnick in this one. Maybe in a grappling match, like a, a grappler we grapple in the heavyweight division, I'm going to be favour Olnick. But with a striker like Mark Hunt, who's got devastating power, only really takes one shot to kind of ring a bell and that's you. I feel a lot more confident picking Mark Hunt and I want to bet him as well. In America, he's minus 225 to 230. In the UK, he is minus 195 to minus 200 in, in that range on a couple of bookies there. So I'm looking at parlaying him and Mirbek Tysimov um, for around, I want to say, minus 110. To 112 in that region, which I think is a really good chance out of cashing, honestly. So that's kind of where the bets I'm looking at as well. So it's Konchenko, who I actually, I never get into that. I bet um, Konchenko with Jeff Neal last week from plus 101, which I thought was great. Really, really a good bet. And Jeff Neal looked impressive as anything last week. Konchenko hopefully follows that one up. Um, 
I've got Krilov three uh, at minus one one, and then I'm going to probably bet Mark Hunt with Mirbek Tysonov, and I'm also looking at Mirbek Tysonov inside the distance as well. So that is my picks for UFC Moscow. I've actually really enjoyed talking about this card. A lot of the kind of newcomers coming in, uh, some decent matchups for them. Um, some of the people I'm looking forward to seeing, like Peter Yan and Tysonov and Konchenko and so on. So it's been nice to speak at this one. We're back next week for UFC. I'm going to Brazil for UFC Fight Night 137. Jimmy Manawagon, Thiago Santos in a banger of a main event, uh, which I'm looking forward to to watching. The, there's a lot of new fighters actually coming through from the Dana White's Contender Series that has been in Brazil. So look, I, I need, I'm going to start, once I get this upload, I'm going to watch a few fights before I go to bed in the next hour, hour and a half. So, so yeah, thank you as always for the support. You guys are awesome. Like, I want to try and see if we can start getting these videos to 100 likes. I'm always around about there, about 92, 93 um, 95 and I'm just like those CD me is kicking in and I want to try and get to 100 if I can uh, or as close to maybe 99 but that would probably piss me off even more that the fact that we're only one away so yeah if you can like comment subscribe if you've got any anything you want to ask me by all means there I've got my email address if you ever want to speak to me not on my YouTube channel and ask me a questions and stuff and by all means um, but yeah thank you for watching I'll be back next week for UFC I think I'm in Sao Paulo until then, take care, enjoy the fight, and I will see you all very, very soon. All the best.